Good afternoon and a very warm welcome everyone uh, to this online public panel debate organized by the European Policy Center in the framework of its election monitor series. Today, uh, we plan to zoom uh, on the recent presidential elections in Montenegro. In the runoff that took place this past Sunday, the country's ex-minister of economy, Yakov Milatovic, managed to unseat the long-standing incumbent Milo Dukanovic. The latter had been ruling Montenegro uh, for more than three decades. What are the likely implications of these results for the country, for regional dynamics, and also for Montenegro's EU accession aspirations? To help us make sense of the vote and, and also of its impact, we have a panel of distinguished experts, all ladies, uh, including Jovan Amarovic, former Minister of European Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister of Montenegro, and also Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group uh, member, Cindy van den Bergert, Deputy Head of Montenegro and Serbia Unit at DigiNeer um, in the European Commission, and Jelena Dankic, Professor and Director of the Global Governance Program on Southeastern Europe at the European University Institute in Florence. A heartfelt welcome, and thank you very much to all three of you uh, for accepting our invitation and making time to speak here today. As always, um, I will first have an exchange with our panelists, and then I will open the floor for questions and comments from our audience. You know the drill by now. If our participants wish to send us written questions, then please keep them short and please write them um, at any time during our discussion in the dedicated Q&A box that you see on your screens. I will try to wave into our conversation um, all queries that I receive uh, from our participants. Alternatively, um, I will ask those in the audience who wish to intervene live to raise their virtual hand um, and to wait for me to give them the floor uh, when the time comes. And with that, let's get started. I would like to, um, to maybe begin um, by asking Elena uh, to tell us more details about the results of, of these presidential elections and to share with us her reading of the importance of this outcome. Does this vote mark the end of, a, of an era, Elena? Uh, thank you so much, Corina. Thank you for uh, these uh, very inspiring and quite complex, to be honest, questions. Uh, and thanks for uh, for the invitation to to take part in this uh, in this webinar session. Now, as you've rightly pointed out, um, at the second round of uh, presidential elections in in Montenegro, Yakov Milatovic has won by sixty point one percent of votes over the longstanding. Uh, President, former president, former prime minister, et cetera, et cetera, Milo, uh, Milo Djukanovic. And I think um, the way in which I see all of this is um, the way in which the whole presidential race actually took place. Uh, and then I can say something about possibly the implications of this for um, the let's say, uh, future of Montenegro, the future of its uh, internal domestic politics, especially in view of the upcoming parliamentary elections, but also in the context of um, EU enlargement and Montenegro's uh, road towards the uh, European Union. Now, the first thing that comes to mind, and I think we've heard this from quite a lot of um, commentators worldwide, was that this was not a vote for Milatovic. This was a vote against Tukanovic. And I'm currently in Montenegro. I arrived here yesterday, and I was um, surprised to see uh, all of the posters inviting people to vote against Djukanovic. So I think that this is also one more thing that uh, is telling, in a way, uh, of how people have felt of this uh, over three decades of, uh, of rule of the DPS. Uh, now, uh, the way in which I see this uh, result in the context of uh, the relationship between the DPS and Montenegro, I would say that this was largely symbolic because the DPS had lost the elections uh, a couple of years ago. And this was perhaps 
the last remnant, let's say, a symbolic one of uh, of its uh, of its uh, of its at least formal rule uh, in Montenegro. I'll come to uh, the implications of other things which uh, which still persist in the country. Now, as I was saying, this was not a vote uh, for Yakov Milatovic, but rather a vote against Djukanovic. And what I found interesting was to think about the fact that Milatovic was not even the first choice of Europe now for the presidential race. It was uh, Milojko Spajic, the uh, president of the party, who um, was... Uh, uh, disqualified for from the presidential race uh, after uh, it uh, after uh, it has been uh, revealed uh, in uh, at least in the media uh, that he had uh, dual citizenship, which essentially meant that he uh, had uh, lost his Montenegrin citizenship by force of law uh, upon uh, obtaining the passport of uh, of Serbia. Now there have been. Uh, different interpretations of uh, this, this result. Uh, and I'll just focus on two things. Uh, one was the question uh, that has been raised uh, both among scholars, commentators, journalists, etc., as to who the dominant supporters of Milatovic have been, uh, whether he has been able to unify the opposition himself or whether he had been supported by uh, the church, the Serbian Orthodox Church predominantly, but also some of the foreign actors that uh, that would be uh, close to uh, close to Serbia, close to Russia. Now, these have been things that have been in the public discourse. They, these have been things that have been discussed, but I think that time will tell uh, as the story unfolds. And I think that right now commenting on any such issues would be uh, slightly uh, difficult without uh, adequate uh, adequate uh, evidence and uh, and support. Um, the implications of uh, this win uh, for uh, for Montenegro, again, there have been different um, narratives that have been cir circulating in uh, in the public discourse. Uh, one has been that, uh, well, finally, after 30 years, uh, Montenegro has rid itself of the, let's say, single party rule, which had captured all the institutions and the full uh, and the large scale of the country's economy. Uh, now, to what ex to one extent, I would agree with that. However, I think that uh, whoever stays in power, uh, whether it's Milatovic or whoever else, um, there's a lot to be done. Uh, meaning, uh, now that Djukanovic and the DPS are no longer in power, uh, there is a house to be cleaned and a house to be prepared for uh, the future EU membership. Uh, and that's not going to be easy because the legacy that uh, remains with whoever, and that was the case also with the two governments that uh, have come after August 2020, uh, there is a legacy of divided society, there is a legacy of a fractured economy, there is a legacy of poorly functioning state institutions and very fragile inter-ethnic relations. And I think managing all of those things uh, is not an easy task, and it takes time, takes a lot of planning, a lot of strategy, and a lot of uh, political trade-offs uh, that will be necessary uh, for Montenegro, whoever uh, is in power. Now, this brings me to my second point, and I'll have one more, and then I'll um, then I'll conclude. Uh, the second point is uh, what this means, this victory means for the internal politics of Montenegro. Uh, again, I think uh, that it will play into the forthcoming parliamentary elections. Uh, and I think that uh, with Milatovic as president, uh, the potential of uh, Europa Sad of Europe now uh, to gain a substantive share of uh, votes in the elections and become actually a parliamentary party has increased substantively. Uh, I think that quite a lot of the... Um, Quite a lot of the parties that had previously capitalized on the nationalistic uh, cards might might see a decrease um, of the share of votes. 
Uh, so I, I guess that we'll see perhaps some reconfiguration of political forces uh, in Montenegro. Uh, now, obviously, that also entails a weakened DPS uh, and weakened uh, parties that had constituted the various formations of government over the past uh, over the past two years. Uh, whether that will bring us towards stability, I'm not so certain, uh, but I would say that it's too easy to tell because I think the following months will be crucial. Uh, for understanding Montenegro's future. Uh, they will be crucial uh, for seeing who makes coalitions uh, with whom and at what costs. Uh, and those are the things that will then play into the dynamics of EU accession. And this is going to be the final point that uh, I will make. I think what uh, is essential uh, in the context of Montenegro and its relationship with the European Union is for the country to, in a way, set its priorities and follow them. Uh, because um, over the last 12 years, uh, roughly, there has been very little progress in terms of Montenegro's uh, ex at least formal accession uh, to the EU. And I think uh, a lot has still need a lot still needs to be done. Uh, and we can see that in uh, in the annual reports on on the country's progress. And I think that is a clear indication where uh, the institutions, the politicians need to invest their forces uh, and energy and just move on from some uh, politically polarizing issues and focus on concrete things that can uh, lead this country towards democracy and the better future. And on this optimistic note, I think I will uh, finish the brief speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yelena. <clears throat> a lot of uh, uncertainty, but um, if if I understand correctly, there is also quite a bit of um, opportunity um, that lies ahead, which hopefully the country will uh, will see seeds. Um, perhaps one um, uh, short follow up question to what I've heard from you. You said that this was a vote against Dukanovic quite clearly, and I'm I was wondering if you could. Um, tell us why has Dukanovic and his party um, started to lose support? Why why have they grown to be so unpopular after all this time? Um, is it a question of time uh, doing its work, or or is there more there? How do we explain this um, this loss of votes? Well, I, I think one could write a book about it. So it would be something like the rise and fall of uh, Milo Djukanovic. Uh, and I think that uh, once you've captured a state, once you have achieved, and I think um, people have not seen uh, that their lives had become better. Rather, they... Uh, I believe had this impression of being locked uh, in this country and its institutions. And you know, perhaps these votes have been a sign of protest. Uh, obviously, over 2019, 2020, there had been the issue with the uh, law on uh, on religion. And I think that this was a sort of, a, it wasn't the main reason for the fall of Djukanovic, but it was perhaps a trigger um, that played into uh, his fall because it essentially uh, pushed some people who may have had some religious inclinations but would have voted for Djukanovic uh, to, in a way, uh, shift their position. So that might be one reason. Uh, the second reason is that I think uh, it has become obvious to quite a lot of commentators, to um, quite a lot of also international institutions, that when it comes to good governance and rule of law, um, Montenegro has not performed uh, quite well, so to use a euphemism under the DPS and under Djukanovic. So I think that um, when you live in a reality, without the rule of law. And when you see that politicians as uh, 
Dalibor Kuljarevic said at uh, at an event in Rome recently, rule over the law, uh, you actually become disenchanted with, uh, with the system. Uh, and the third reason why I think that uh, less and less people uh, are voting um, for for the DPS is possibly a path dependency from the uh, loss of elections in 2020 because uh, a share of votes that the DPS had uh, was obtained through the sort of a state capture and employing relatives and people and in a way controlling the voters through uh, different uh, mechanisms of the system itself. Now, once um, a new share, uh, perhaps, of people were admitted into different institutions, uh, they were no longer inclined to vote for uh, for the DPS. So I believe that there's a combination of factors that uh, essentially has led to the progressive uh so the progressive um, decline in support for uh, for the DPS. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, I will now turn to to Jovana and um, uh, to ask her how surprised is she about this result, and and how surprised should we all be about this outcome? Was it uh, something to be expected or not, uh, Jovana? Many thanks, thanks, Corinna. It's always a pleasure to join DPC's events, even online. So it's also my pleasure today to discuss the results of Montenegro's elections. I think uh, it is always a surprise to see Jukanovic beaten uh, at the elections because this, this happened just two times for the last 33 years. So it is a surprise, but it's it's not in effect because all the all the public opinion polls, all the developments in the recent two years, actually showed that we uh, it, this is uh, this was expected by many and by citizens because citizens now in Montenegro they really believe in change through elections, and this is something uh, which is positive. <laughs> Let's start with positive things. So after the elections in 2020, in August, uh, there, there is public opinion research, a poll by uh, BIEPAC, done, done by BIEPAC, that 80% of people in Montenegro now believe uh, in change through elections. So even though we have the same, uh, 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 let's say, conditions for, for elections, people now really the day and do some just voting. So now we had the years, we have the new president for the uh, next couple of years, we will not have Mila Jukanovic either as the prime minister or the president of the country. This is something which is for sure positive for a small country, which uh, managed to change the government uh, for, for the first time uh, uh, after 30 years. So um, this is, uh, let's say, something which is positive. When it comes to implications of the result, I have to say also this is a more like a symbolic message or symbolic move. And also because not, not just because uh, of, uh, uh, let's say that we have the more important elections in, in June, parliamentary elections, but also that the president of the country really has limited responsibility. He is not influencing developments. He is not influencing the public policies. He is just implementing, and he has really important role in the foreign policy course and the other, let's say, protocol or things. But in sense that he is influencing the policy in the country, he is not. Uh, he has not much responsibility in that in that sense. So what is to be expected for the parliamentary elections in June? I don't think that it's now for sure that the European Europe now will have the most seats in the parliament. We are also expecting that the DPS will lose more support, uh, even more support from the citizens. Uh, it is expected to have like 25% of, of support, more or less. And then the thing is that the, the next government most probably will have some of the radical parties in it. Uh, if we, we judge by the announcements or by the statements of, of the president of the, of the Europe now and the other parties. So most probably the next government will be formed by Europe now, Democrats, DF and URA. 
So that means almost the same situation as it at the moment. So basically, I don't expect that the government will be backed up in the parliament by two third majority, even not uh, the, the, uh, um, the 49, which is necessary for really important appointments in the judiciary and also for all important reforms in the rule of law, including the uh, ele uh, elections and ele electoral legislation. That's the first thing. The second thing is also that having the radical party in the government means um, different rhetorics from the official one, let's say also in, in that sense. And also I have to say that uh, as Yelena already said, we had the different government from 2020 and there were no major changes in the EU enlargement process and the European integration process of negotiations with the European Union. I have to say that we are still negotiating with the European Union on the same conditions that we received more years ago, that the political ones are about the, the uh, reform, the rule of law reform, judiciary reform, appointments of the members of the Judicial Council and also Supreme State Prosecutor, for all of that, we need consensus among, among political parties. And this was always, always hard to reach because the Mont uh, Montenegrin society is deeply polarized. Uh, this, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, division between a position and majority in the parliament was always 41-40. So this is just simple majority and that's not enough for important in reforms. So I have to say that, that there is really need, even now for the political dialogue in the country, there is a need for to define at least five priorities for the uh, new government, but also to deal with the rest of the political parties in the parliament in order to find that, that kind of consensus which is, which is necessary for the reforms and in order to, to, uh, to, to receive a better this interim report uh, on fulfillment of interim benchmarks and also to receive the closing benchmarks within the chapters 23 and 24. That's the first concern when it comes to the implications of the results of the presidential re results and what, to be, what is to be expected for the, the parliamentary elections in June. The second thing is about the foreign policy orientation of the country. I really do not expect any major sh shifts Montenegro is fully aligned with the full common foreign and security policy of the European Union. Uh, we introduced all the packages of the sanctions towards Russia and we are really uh, fine in that ten set sense. And this is also uh, something which is already announced and highlighted by the newly elected president that Montenegro will keep this course and also uh, will fulfill all the obligation in, all obligations in NATO. So, this fear of Serbian world and influence of uh, uh, the other non-democratic uh, actors is on hold at least at least at the moment. That's the, 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 the also important thing. And then the third thing is, uh, which is not uh, uh, positive, I have to say, is that uh, uh, the uh, open Balkans is still ongoing topic in the country, even though. Uh, there was, there is uh, uh, analysis uh, done by the Ministry of European Affairs, which actually showed that there is no rush to join this initiative. That we have really European path as the as the really the most important goal. For your country, that we have both regional and also and that we are already participating in the Berlin process. And um, yesterday or two days ago, the, the three agreements signed within the Berlin process were ratified in the parliament. But the first message from the Serbian president after the elections uh, was that the open Balkans is still on the table and that he is expecting, judging by the statements of the now Jakob Milatovic, that he is expecting Montenegro to join the Open Balkans. And I think that, that it was not really good sign from, from his side. And also I'm afraid that the Open Balkans is something which is now 
fully supported by the political parties which are going to, to, to um, form the next government. So this is more or less uh, what are the implications. There are some positive, there are some negative, but I think that um, I don't, don't expect any major changes in the next two or three years. Mm, okay, thank you so much, uh, Yavana. I'm wondering um, what will happen to DPS in the post Dukanovic era? What, what do you think? Is the, are there any chance that it will transform into a you know, normal central left, left party? Um, that would be one question. And then, of course, you, you say that there won't be any, um, uh, you don't anticipate any uh, changes in the foreign policy orientation of the country. But of course, uh, uh, do you think that there's a chance that they will join the Open uh, Balkan Initiative? And how will that uh, be reconciled and squared with the commitments in the Berlin process? Uh, for DPS, there was huge international pressure for the last two years that, that the party has to be reformed, that the young faces has to, to, to cover the all important positions, that the corrupt politicians uh, uh, have to be removed from the parliament and from the, you know, like uh, uh, high positions in the party. But nothing has changed in the party because Milo Djukanovic actually not just the capture, he not just captured the state, but also his own party. So he did everything for the last, I don't know, 30 years to be the only face, you know, of the party. And so, but this is it was this was just also uh, his backup plan, you know, to, to say on as the president forever and not to be. Uh, um, uh, to, to stop any kind of uh, uh, cases against him and the rest. So um, I don't know. Uh, there are a few, uh, let's say, visible people there and there are young people which are really, um, I don't know, well-educated. They are, you know, they don't have uh, any kind of corrupt scandals by their name. So maybe there is a chance to, to, to afford for the party to be reformed. But I have to say that the DPS is really clientelistic party, that uh, lots of members will most probably, you know, change the side and go to the Europe now, because what uh, has never changed in Montenegro is this party employment and this, you know, rushing to, to, uh, to show support to, to, the, to uh, uh, new actors and to, to parties which are in power. So I really, uh, I'm really expecting uh, lots of members to go towards Europe now at the moment. When it comes to the Open Balkans, I, I, I don't know, because everything is possible. And uh, uh, one of the explanation why uh, there is need or why is good to join the Open Balkans by some of the political parties is that there is no obligation to stay there, that everything is on voluntary basis, that uh, most of agreements are memorandums, that uh, uh, there are clear uh, information and data about success of the initiative, about improvement of trade, but that's not true because so far it's impossible to, to measure what are the implications and what, what are the results of the Open Balkans Initiative. Because uh, so far, the Serbia ratified some of the agreements and also North Macedonia recently ratif ratified a few of them. So if there are improvements uh, when it comes to trade and some other areas, there are results of the other initiative, initiatives, TEFTA, uh, um, some initiatives within the Berlin process, so it's not uh, because of the Open Balkans. So hopefully not, but uh, but let's see. All right, thank you so much, Jovana. Um, Miss um, van den Berger, I come to you. Uh, the subject of um, European integration uh, has already come up, and uh, we also heard uh, um, those voices uh, who argue that this political change uh, that uh, is uh, underway in um, Montenegro could help to um, to 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 revitalize, in a sense, uh, the country's uh, EU membership. Aspects. 
where does Montenegro stand at the moment on the EU track, uh, at least according to uh, the European Commission's assessment? And um, what are the main uh, points on the to-do list if Montenegro is to advance and, and graduate uh, the negotiation, the accession negotiations? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for inviting me um, to, to uh, discuss with you today. Uh, indeed, a very interesting times, um, just to, to uh, shortly summarize what the previous speakers uh, have, uh, have already raised. Um, when it comes to um, uh, EU membership, because that's, of course, what we're talking about for the future, um, to underline first that this is the aspiration of uh, overwhelming majority of the citizens. So I think that's a very important starting point um, and something for uh, any and all political parties to take uh, due account of. Um, of course, for that, uh, it's very important to have a, a political stability. This is key uh, for advancing on the path uh, towards the EU. Uh, and this is, of course, a process that delivers benefits for Montenegro and also for Europe as a whole. Um, and then I wanted to highlight what's very important now is um, that the, the world has changed um, in the past year. Um, of course, uh, we, we've seen EU enlargement gaining momentum uh, and it's, it's high on the political agenda. Um, the, the member states are, uh, of course, more interested in it. We have, um, and I don't mean this in any uh, bad way, but we have more competitors in the, in the arena when it comes to enlargement. Um, and then, of course, uh, with Montenegro um, being, I think, on, on paper, still a front runner when it comes to the negotiations with, with the chapters opened, um, uh, it hasn't been able to take the opportunity that was there, it was open, it was an open door, it's just a matter of, of uh, pushing through. Um, and, and Montenegro hasn't uh, been taking that opportunity, it was at a standstill, and uh, I think standing um, standing still is actually moving backwards, uh, of course. Um, so it's it's been going in the wrong direction. And this is uh, really risks now, if this would continue, risks missing an historic opportunity if it doesn't now refocus on the accession process. And I would add that uh, already too much time in the past few years has been lost when it comes to the accession process. Now, when it um, comes to um, what to be looking for, I mean, political stability, of course, as I said, um, I think in the past period, focus of politicians has been too much on, on let's say, ethnic and religious matters to the detriment of, of fundamental reforms that are necessary for the EU uh, accession process. Um, and, and again, I, I, it's so important that I keep underlining it, all political stakeholders um, should understand the gravity of this situation. And, and I don't think we are we are yet at that point, but of course, uh, um, open to look at all the opportunities that may now open up. Um, while I also think now that with, uh, with these elections, which of course have been incredibly interesting, um, and uh, but then between now and the parliamentary elections, it, it will not be fully clear in which direction uh, uh, potential future government, and I, I agree on the assessment that was already provided, um, full clarity on the attentions of a future government will only be clear after the parliamentary elections and the formation of, of, a, of a government. Um, because of course the white support that was provided now uh, into uh, um, electing Mr. Milatovic or not electing Mr. Djukanovic, whichever angle to look at it, um, uh, it's it's been it's important now I guess for 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 Europe now to try and cover uh, all areas uh, in order to and then take this forward and so their real um, as a political line when it comes to uh, the European accession process uh, will become clearer uh, only later I expect although I need to uh, of course remind that uh, Mr Milatovic has mentioned that he wants his first uh, visit after inauguration to be to Brussels. So, I mean, there's there's a couple of very interesting and, and positive signs there. Um, so, of course, we we are we would be very happy if, if he does that and uh, to uh, and I'm sure there will be people to receive him here. Uh, welcome here in Brussels also. Um, now, when it comes to your other question, what's on the to do list? What's the homework uh, that Montenegro needs to look at? Um, 
Of course, uh, the, the chapters, the, num the magic numbers have been mentioned, uh, 23 and 24 are still the magic numbers. Um, the, the homework at the table um, is to uh, push forward on the rule of law chapters, and most, and those are 23, 24, um, the interim benchmarks. This is where we are at the moment. And actually, it's uh, in our uh, negotiating framework, as you probably know, overall progress in the negotiation depends on the progress in the area of rule of law. So without progress in this area, um, it won't be, we won't be able to move on the other chapters. Uh, technically, yes, we can progress, it, but we will not be able to make any political decisions when it comes to closing a chapter. So first, interim benchmarks uh, on the rule of law chapters. Um, so this means uh, addressing gaps when it comes to media freedom, uh, freedom of expression, fight against corruption, fight against organized crime, um, also to accelerate and deepen reforms on independence, professionalism, accountability of judiciary. I mean, these are all uh, big words, but it's also there's also big deeds needed in order to um, address uh, the benchmarks there. Um, there are also issues when it comes to electoral framework, uh, the legal electoral framework. There are still gaps uh, and ab ambiguities um, that actually undermines effectiveness uh, of, of electoral process. And so that also needs to be revised. It's something that's been on the table for a while, as of course also the interim benchmarks are. So that's that's the, 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 the key uh, area where we need to, to see uh, Progress. It's. I know it's not the easiest area, of course. So that's of course why these these are the key um, issues um, for for any country. Of course, not just for Montenegro, but at this stage, this is where we where we are for Montenegro. And uh, so, without that, we cannot make progress in accession. Um, so important for all stakeholders to understand the, the the gravity of this situation and also the opportunity that is there. I want to underline that again, like I said in the beginning. There is really an opportunity now with um, the enlargement policy really being higher on the political agenda uh, also in the EU. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's, I'd like to keep it for that and see what other question you have for me. I mean, um, one question that comes to mind, um, thank you very much for, for, for your intervention, is, um, is to ask whether, um, Provided that the new political configuration is more stable and remains uh, um, oriented towards uh, Europe, uh, do you think there is anything that the um, EU and the European Commission could do more uh, better, different, um, in order to help Montenegro with these very stubborn areas of, of reform? Or do you think that the, um, um, the strategy is in place and it needs no further adjustments? I mean, we are in a new uh, geopolitical context. Uh, uh, you say that there is a momentum. Um, is there anything that we could um, do somewhat differently in order to see things progress, of course, again, the caveat being that um, uh, things also change on the side of, of Montenegro in terms of having more of a stable coalition in place that remains pro-European. Yes, well, I think if, if indeed, if there is a stable coalition, if the, if the, the direction is very clearly uh, uh, it's it's about uh, joining EU in the future, and and I think also other international stakeholders in uh, present in Montenegro also very much uh, following the same line, uh, supporting uh, EU uh, accession process. Um, yes, of course, we we are uh, interested to to help more. We already help a lot. I have to say there is a lot of support provided to actually all the countries, so also to Montenegro. Um, also, especially on on these uh, very difficult areas, um, and uh, and and there, and we realize there is a uh, there are a lot of interim benchmarks. It's not a very short list. Um, it's it's very serious list. Um, so wherever we can, um, we do provide uh, support uh, when whether it comes to let's, let's say long term projects to really support uh, reforms and uh, and uh, deepening of reforms. Um, we also um, provide short-term uh, assistance if it is necessary. Um, so we're also, of course, looking into, for instance, issues related to the cyber attacks and 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 to to see how we can uh, can can gear up uh, support and and um, strengthen resilience 
um, we, from the EU perspective for, for Montenegro, so how to support better there. So that's, uh, of course, an immediate response to, to uh, the cyber attacks of, of last year. Um, and, and we're also looking uh, at uh, issues related to, um, uh, to, let's say, if the, that's the other side, if the political volatility would stay, um, then, of course, there is also the, um, the issue that we've had in the past months with institution not functioning properly and then opens up uh, the vulnerability of the country to disinformation, external interference, and also cyber attacks. So that's something we're, um, it's the other side of the medal, but we were also trying to be concerned and to see whether we can support and how we can support Montenegro best there. So overall, uh, the commission, I think um, we can say is, is uh, Montenegro's best, friends in, uh, best friend in this. And uh, we're very much um, um, interested to, 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 to support as, as best as we can. And we're in very close um, relations, of course, with the institutions in Montenegro to, uh, to achieve that. Um, yes, a, a, a big uh, political stability will definitely make a difference. Uh, we know how how it's a small country. We also know how the, the let's say political nominations uh, can have an impact through, but we also can see that there is a, a determined, uh, uh, quite a lot of determined people in, uh, in the institutions that really want to, and are really working hard um, to, uh, to progress uh, for Montenegro and we are very um, committed to, uh, to support. Okay, thank you so much um, to you and uh, actually to, to everyone for this first uh, round of, um, uh, of remarks. I would now like to give the opportunity to our participants to um, ask questions or um, uh, make any comments in reaction to what has been said. Um, please um, use the opportunity to uh, raise your hand and, um, um, and address us directly. In the meantime, I will post uh, the one written uh, comment that we have from Pierre Jetton, um, who is um, um, saying that during the election campaign, Europe now has been quite vague about its concrete plans for EU and reform. Can you give a picture of Milatovic's stance towards the EU? I mean, we've heard that he had, um, he has hope of getting Montenegro into the EU in, within the next five years, um, or so I've read in some of, uh, of the media. Um, how likely is that and based on what plans? Uh, who would like to, to take that question? Uh, maybe Jelena or Jovana? Yeah. Well, I can start. Perhaps Jovana can follow up with some uh, more detailed issue. I think whoever takes Montenegro into the EU in the next five years will be some sort of a miracle maker um, in terms of pushing forward the kind of reforms that are actually needed for EU accession. I think we need to be realistic here. There is opportunity, as we have heard, but there's also plenty of work to be done. Um, and this work would need to be concrete work. Uh, yes, Milatovic is... Um, formerly pro-European, the party is called uh, Europe Now. Um, I think it's uh, called Europe Now more in terms of uh, um, being closer to Europe economically in terms of living standards, et cetera, et cetera, than in terms of meeting the criteria for uh, for EU accession. But in a way, I think that beyond talking the talk, um, not only Milatovic, but also whoever forms the government next will need to walk the walk and actually uh, cross all of the obstacles uh, that exist there already. And uh, beyond the issues uh, related to the rule of law that we've uh, just heard about, which are central in a way for integrating in the EU. You can't have single market approximation unless you have the rule of law. You can't have all sorts of other things unless you have the rule of law. So that's uh, that should be a top priority of any new government. Economic reform is going to be much needed, especially given the current economic situation in Montenegro, which I won't uh, be going into too much detail. 
Uh, there will be quite a lot of social issues and social pressures, especially uh, as a consequence of the current uh, state of the healthcare system and the welfare system. So that's another perhaps item on the agenda for uh, the new government to be able to bring Montenegro closer to the EU. And the pressures co caused by, and this is perhaps my uh, other obsession, uh, the pressures caused by uh, migratory flows, both the inward and the outward migration and the way in which uh, these will be handled in, uh, in the next period. So I think um, that uh, we've heard already from um, from all of our speakers, and I think you mentioned it in the introduction also, Corina, uh, that quite a lot of energy has been wasted over the past, I wouldn't say only two years, but for the past 30 years on political divisions, ethnic divisions, religious divisions, where I think uh, these energy, if focused properly on adequate economic and political reform could essentially in the some, midterm period bring Montenegro closer uh, to the European Union because the public support indeed uh, for more moving towards the EU is still there, still. <laughs> Let's see how it works out. Um, thank you, Elena. Um, one of the um, questions for you is if I if I can abuse the fact that you have taken the floor. Um, we've heard from Yavana that she's not uh, too worried of a of a shift in the uh, foreign policy orientation of um, of the country. And you've mentioned that um, Europe now is a pro-European. Um, uh, actor, but um, there are, of course, those who who fear that there is growing um, influence from Serbia and Russia in Montenegro. Uh, would you share that concern, or um, or rather, Jovanas reading? Well, uh, I think I would be reasonably cautious there to make any firm statements. Uh, Montenegro indeed is fully aligned uh, with the uh, EU's uh, CFSP, but if you take a look at all the politicians and foreign policy agendas, at least on paper, they're all pro-European and uh, geared towards the EU. I mean, there and this is where I'm uh, where I'm seeing one thing is uh, the rhetoric. Uh, of being pro-European. The other thing is what the new government will actually do, because I think the uh, pro-European rhetoric will stay pro-European, and you certainly have it even in Serbia, which is not uh, as um, as which is sitting on two chairs, so to put it nicely, as Dimo Vecchio said it. But you do have a we want to join the European Union rhetoric. But what is being done in practice is something a little bit uh, a little bit different. Now, there might be this shift. Uh, but again, I think uh, this depends on the kinds of trade offs and kinds of political decisions uh, Milatovic and Europe now make uh, if they seek to be in power after the next elections, if that's uh, where the uh, political balances will, will lead. Mm -hmm. And do you think it would also depend on, uh, to quote one of um, um, our participants who raised a uh, further question in, in written, will it also depend on parallel developments between some of Montenegro's neighbors and the European Union, not to name and shame? Um, that might as well happen. Uh, that might as well happen because I think uh, there are way too many question marks now, right? Um, and the way in which uh, this, re let's say, uh, the Bal Western Balkan region is a small region. And what happens in one place cannot happen in complete disconnect from what happens around it. And we all know how relationships uh, amongst neighbors in this region play out in the context of EU accession. So I think that um, what will be happening in the region will also reflect heavily uh, in, uh, in Montenegro. Uh, 
but I would not at this at this point I would wait and see uh there are quite a few different scenarios that might happen in in the context especially of elections and of what happens um with our neighbors and their EU accession uh paths because I think that over the last couple of years uh we have seen certain dynamics that have brought some countries closer towards uh their objective of joining the EU uh we've also seen the trade-offs for that and we've seen the internal dynamics in those countries that have contributed uh to to these developments so it depends on how also the new Montenegrin government will respond to those regional dynamics. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Elena. I will ask a very short question to Jovana before I bring in the two hands, virtual hands that have been raised. Um, Jovana, we've heard um, now from uh, from Elena, but uh, also it was something that I, I, I was meaning to ask you. Um, about how a series of, of very concrete issues, economic, social issues, um, have um, risen to have come to the fore, and and I was wondering whether uh, the campaign, this campaign for uh, for the presidential elections, reflects the importance of these issues, um, and um, and basically whether we have come to new political lines that shape um, the 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 debate, um, or we are still on um ethnic and religious um, um issues as as the commission <laughs> mentioned earlier if you can spare a few words on that and then we'll bring in the virtual hands well we had two parts of the campaign the one which was uh, at, the, uh, at the social media which was all about identity issues and about the referendum question which was back in 2006 whether the Montenegro will still be the independent state or not. So there was kind of history uh, at the social media and then mainly uh, by the supporters of DPS and that pro-Montenegrin bloc, uh, which is in a way also an issue of concern, but it's not that much dramatic, at least at the moment. The second part of the campaign was the regular one to um, uh, uh, regular media and also through um, campaign all the way. And I think that the economic uh, issues were there all the time because it, the, these topics were forced by Jakob Milatovic in Europe now. The, su the success of, the, of Europe now is also based on part of economic issues or let's say fiscal reform which brought some benefits and bigger salaries to, to the citizens and even though this fiscal reform really damaged the, the budget of and public finances of Montenegro uh, citizens are actually revered, rewarded just that part which was connected with the big, uh, bigger salaries so yes the, the economic topics were there but somehow I think that the uh, even Europe now and the former ministers Milatovic and, and uh, Spike are not that much aware what is happening within the system now because of their reform. So I think that you know the, the more complicated issues are coming to their agenda. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and now I, I wanted to ask Andre de Munte and Berta uh, to, to come in. Maybe uh, we start from Andre. Andre, are you still with us? Do you want to take the floor now? Yes. Oops, unmute. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank, uh, th th thank you, Karina. Thank you, everybody. For and so nice to see an all-female panel. We see too many pictures of men only, and uh, happy to see all of you uh, on the screen. Some of you I met in person, uh, others only on screen uh, for now. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I would have three questions, which would include one multiple choice question. Um, I, I mean, for starters, I have to say, uh, I mean, in a gentle way. Uh, I personally don't use the word front runner anymore, uh, be it for Montenegro or for Serbia. Nobody is running. I mean, it's 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 more like the procession of Ekternat, uh for now. But that was clear from all the uh, interventions. I do agree with uh, Yelena on. Uh, I, I mean, 
if you look at the number of organizations that are lobbying the EU institutions, and they are all in their name European, they are all democratic. Uh, if you start scratching, you often see something different. So Europa Sat, it, 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 it sounds nice, but what's in a name? Let's, uh, let's see. Now, uh, regarding the questions, uh, Milatovic made a number of pre-electoral uh, promises, of course, uh, of a well, to some extent, a populist nature, because it's always easy to promise more money and, and handouts to people, uh, and then also see what you can do uh, as per your competences as a president. This would be uh, my first question, but I think in part it was already uh, replied to. So to what extent he could really deliver on easily made pre-electoral promises in a presidential campaign as per his limited competences as president? That would be my first question. My second one, if you were, uh, uh, this is probably more for Yelena and Jovana, if you were to advise Milosevic, what would you single out as his personal immediate litmus test ahead of the parliamentary elections? So like uh, a, a, a genius uh, move, I would say, apart from the reassuring messages on, and I'll come back again to what uh, Yelena said, uh, if you look at his Twitter account, it sounds so nice. Yes, we will continue in the same path, et cetera, et cetera. And then the multiple choice question. Uh, I mean, it's true what Cindy said, that it's a, a positive sign, at least. I mean, and this is not on paper, because I mean, time will tell very soon about his visit, first visit uh, to Brussels. And uh, some people could learn from that, because Boriana Krišto, uh, the, 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 the new chairwoman of the Council of Ministers in Bosnia-Herzegovina's first visit was not to uh, Brussels, but some would say predictably to Zagreb. I mean, you can wonder how come. Uh, now, my multiple question would be, if you were to suggest where the second uh, visit uh, should, uh, sh should be, I mean, do you have any suggestions uh, on that? Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Andre. Um, Berta, do you want to come in quickly at this point? Yeah, um, so thanks a lot to all of you. It was really interesting to hear your uh, analysis. Um, so one of my questions is um, whether this momentum that now can be felt in Brazil. So in Brazil right now, there's this rhetoric of the new momentum for enlargement and so on. Whether you think that this can be felt in Montenegro because some analysts in Serbia and Kosovo or like some people working there, they were saying that despite there's this push in Brussels, this hasn't been translated to the region and people in different countries in the region cannot really feel this, um, that this is, there's this momentum or this like shift of policy, let's say, um, by the EU. And then a second one, like regarding the, the likely government that will be formed after June 11, um, in these past two years, we have seen, well, three years now, uh, we have seen two no confidence votes and two different governments, now one in a technical mandate. Uh, can we expect the government after June 11 to be more stable, to be able to um, finish the, the mandate? Or um, even if now uh, Djukanovic has been uh, toppled, uh, it doesn't like necessarily mean that in um, instability um, will end. Uh, yeah, so these are my two main questions. Then also like I would, just um, ask you to comment or like to ask for your opinion. Um, in, in January this year, um, two of the Montenegrin ministers, the uh, justice and um, finance one, if I'm not wrong, attended the day of the Republika Srpska, which is declared unconstitutional in 2015 and so on. Um, this of course created um, controversy within, within the government and, and by many people outside. Um, just. I would just like to know like why uh, two ministers like attended a celebration which is claimed to be a, a like praising of a genocide and that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Berta. What I suggest is, uh, since most of these questions regard Yelena and Yavana, we get them a chance to reflect on which of these they want to pick uh, up and, and, and answer. And in the meantime, I come back to Ms. van den Burgert because there are because there are two written questions that mostly concern the commission. And one is, uh, comes from Isabel Ioannidis, uh, who is asking whether the staged accession uh, model is discussed at all uh, in the commission 
as a means uh, to um, overcome the lack of political appetite um, for enlargement among the member states. And, and then there is another question from an anonymous attendee um, asking whether um, having in mind the new non-paper on the rule of law um, being drafted by the EC, what can Montenegro expect? Is uh, ICG, IGC during the Swedish presidency cur something the country can expect? How about EBAR? Um, so maybe I think this concern more the commission and uh, maybe you can answer those while the, um, the other two panelists are reflecting on their own replies. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Corina. Yes, uh, I recognize the, the acronyms, so it's probably <laughs> for me. Um, uh, let's just take them. I had already looked at them. Um, when it comes to um, the issue of um, the political appetite at the EU level, this, which was part of the question related to the, to the staged um, accession, um, it is, of course, true that um, there's two sides. I mean, in, in the end, when it comes to accession, the country that exceeds the EU needs to be fully ready. Um, but the EU needs also to be ready to receive. Um, and, and that requires that there was a communication a couple of years ago about this. Um, this also requires um, uh, some some thinking and some uh, some changes, probably also on EU side. So that, that there needs to be a full readiness um, for that. So that that is, of course, true. But I do really uh, see now that there is this um, uh, momentum. Um, there, there is really now a, a, a political shift in the thinking. And I, I can see it also from the context with member states who, who uh, really uh, engage much, uh, much deeper and, and uh, focus, monitor much stronger where things are. And uh, it, it, it's, it's become a very um, interesting topic um, for now to, to discuss. Um, of course, when it comes to accession, um, the process, as you know, and this is a general commission uh, a drill, I'm going to say now, but it is a merit based process. Um, and therefore, we have all these chapters and we have all the negotiations. And then we have, of course, chapters in the clusters now. Um, and uh, so it is merit based. But of course, um, it's also clear that uh, member states uh, look at political developments. And the political developments in the past period in Montenegro have not been viewed very positively by member states. Um, so for the moment, um, uh, sh should such uh, developments or, or uncertainty, political instability uh, continue, um, I'm not expecting uh, much uh, cooperation from Montenegro from, from member states. So there is, of course, also an issue there. There is a distinction between what the commission can do to support and what, uh, what then the council at a political level also uh, makes as decisions. When it comes to stage accession, um, in what, of course, what we're, what we're looking at very closely is um, how to engage and include the countries more in different processes that the EU uh, runs so that there is a, um, a better understanding of future uh, member states on how uh, the processes work and they can, can view as observer in certain meetings um, uh, and it also means that from the EU side that uh, member states are used to seeing these people around the table and so that it becomes uh, a more gradual uh, process. So in terms of really uh, discussing staged uh, accession and, uh, and where countries are, this is uh, not from, for the moment, but it is, of course, something that, that we will uh, look at later on in the year when, uh, when we get to our annual report, which for the first time will cover 10 countries. Also, so in terms of um, uh, so th then it will actually be very interesting because we will also be able to see uh, where um, where the the new trio, as we call them, uh, stand uh, compared to uh, to to the seven that have uh, for years been uh, covered by uh, by the annual package. So that will be a very interesting um, interesting thing to see. But as I said, we we really try to um, to encourage and involve where we can um, the, the countries already um, in the in, in our political political technical all sorts of discussions when it comes to certain uh, groups that we that we have for all different topics now when it comes to the rule of law paper I uh, this today I will certainly not give a preview I'm very sorry so that's not uh, to be expected from me today but it is in the works and it should be out in uh, with, within six weeks or, or something like that six weeks or 
I think it's six or eight weeks. I don't know the date from the top of my head. Um, when it comes to IGC, it's also not a question for me, it's for the presidency. So I cannot answer the question other than that I haven't seen a, a request uh, for the moment. Uh, so that's maybe also answering partly the question. And when it comes to the interim benchmark assessment report, um, I would say for uh, not just yet, uh, this really depends on uh, the developments by Montenegro. We'd be delighted to draft uh, interim benchmark assessment report, um, but with the sort of standstill in the past two years, um, I think uh, that this is not going to be uh, on the table for, for, for this year. And, uh, and, uh, but that having said that, we really do um, uh, encourage Montenegro to continue there because we're very interested to, to take this up and to see with Montenegro how we can progress in these areas. So I hope that answers most of those questions. Yes, I, I, I think it, it it basically did. Thank you very much. And because this is the last time that I can come back to you since uh, we have only 10 minutes left and I still need to allow um, the other panelists to have their say, I want to um, ask you a, a final difficult and very big question uh, with uh, the, uh, this, the, in June this year we're celebrating um, um, several decades from Thessaloniki, um, and um, I was wondering um, whether there is any work or any um, anything planned from uh, the EU and the Commission to to sort of mark the occasion, especially at this time of. Um, perhaps constructive competition, or I, I, would, I don't know how to call it, because you said that this co new competition created in the new geopolitical context was positive. If there was going to be anything that we can expect to sort of mark this occasion. To be honest, I, I wouldn't be able to answer your question because actually I don't know. It, this could very well be, but in any case, it's not past my desk. So, uh, and that doesn't say it's very much. So I, I really couldn't be answering the question uh, there. When it comes to a competition, um, that, that's how I try to, to describe it also when I speak to the countries also to, to encourage because in, in a way, yeah, it's competition. Uh, I don't want to, to a competition to be explained in a negative way. But it's also an issue of you have to share the limelight with more people. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are sometimes uh, big countries. And I will, I will say, of course, the word Ukraine, because that's a very big place. And, um, and that, that has a lot, gets a lot of attention, of course, uh, for, for, for those reasons they are right. Um, but when it, we focus only on enlargement part, um, that's, of course, also to be expected that there will be quite some attention uh, to them. And then, of course, on the other end, you have uh, Montenegro in terms of size, I mean, <laughs> in terms of population. So um, th there is, in that sense, a sort of competition and into, you know, to, 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 to attract the attention and to attract the attention, you need to do your homework. And um, for Montenegro, having a uh, most chapters open. I will not repeat the word uh, that I said before because Andre made very clear and he's very right that nobody's running at the moment. Um, but the one, let's say, most advanced on on uh, on paper at the moment, and we would really like to um, to see them uh, pick up the baton and uh, and continue uh, continue running, uh, hopefully in, into the future. Well, let's hope they do. Thank you very much. Um, and now for the last uh, 10 minutes, um, or a bit less than that, I turn to Jelena and Jovana. You've received a very long uh, list of questions, including multiple questions. So <laughs> for your um, uh, final words, please feel free to cherry pick and to um, give us your, um, your last remarks. Um, who wants to go uh, first? Maybe Jovana this time, since Jelena started last time, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, this uh, front runner status, I agree, that doesn't matter anymore because we are negotiating for almost 11 years. But I have to say that if there is a Western Balkan country which has a chance to join the European Union first and next, that's Montenegro, and that's for sure. So let, let's use the explanation that Montenegro will be the next EU member state. Member state. So the next thing about uh, um, what should be the uh, second visit of, of uh, President Milatovic, I think that it should be Kosovo for sure, because uh, uh, this is a neighboring country and it would stop all the rumors, all the calculations, whether the Montenegro is changing this uh, orientation and the recognition of Kosovo and the rest. So 
this would be also my first advice to him. The second one is not to join the Open Balkans, not during his mandate. That's the, the, the second advice. And I have to say that uh, for the third advice is, of course, uh, not to uh, have DEF in the new government. That is something which actually complicates the chances to form the new government, but this is also a precondition for the government to be pro-European and to be on the European path. So the second thing about the momentum for the for, for Montenegro, yes, I th also think that the chance is still there because if, if there is a stable government, it is possible to fulfill uh, at least the most important benchmarks and criteria in the next three years. That's, that's my opinion because I was leading the European integration process of the country and I am following the, the European integration process for the last 20 years, so since the Solendiki. So I think that Montenegro is really small country without open bilateral issues, without uh, any uh, problems in the foreign policy course and that this, these uh, most complicated reforms in the rule of law area are possible if there is consensus among political parties. And as you already said, all the political parties are on the paper for the European integration process. There is 76% of the citizens of Montenegro which are supporting the European uh, Union's membership in the, in the European Union. That means that there, there is no party in Montenegro which is ready to uh, somehow, you know, uh, not working on the European path and, and on, the, on the obligations which are on, on our European path. Then the question whether we are entering the more stable uh, phase in Montenegro and more stable government, I'm not sure because uh, lots of political parties, lots of political interests over there, and uh, most probably there will be coalition agreement with, before the, the, the forming the government. And I'm quite sure that they were fighting over the uh, political posts and positions and party employment. So uh, there will be lots of pressure among political parties entering the governments. That's why I'm not sure whether this government also will be stable or not. And then uh, for Brussels visit, I have to say that also um, Prime Minister Krivokapic and Prime Minister Abbasic, they also visited <laughs> Brussels as the first official visit, but that wasn't helpful for the reforms in the country. And then when it comes to the uh, interim benchmark uh, assessment report, uh, yes, I'm quite aware that we uh, have not fulfilled the interim benchmarks, but there is also need for a positive sign for Montenegro in this whole process because uh, all the criteria, Dale, and all interim benchmarks, they are technical and they are long-term goals. And I think that there is a need just to make it, uh, make them more concrete and call it closing benchmarks in order to have this kind of push in the European integration process of, of the country. That's also my opinion. And then the question when the European Union will be ready for the new members, I have to say that we are also waiting for this answer when the European Union will be stronger in order to be bigger. I don't see any major changes in the European, European Union's approach towards the Western Balkans because the granting the candidate status, opening the negotiations is not something which is guaranteeing, st guaranteeing uh, stability in the Western Balkans. There is a need for some big shifts, let's say in that way, some more radical decisions from the European Union's level, whether it is state accession or not, whether it is uh, some kind of granting some benefits for the countries which are fully aligned with the common foreign and security policy, there is a need to change approach in order to have this uh, stability in the Western Balkans. Thank you so much, uh, Jovana, for this very concrete and clear um, pieces of advice. Uh, Jelena, you have the last one minute and a bit of this meeting. <laughs> okay. Um... So uh, first on Milatovic's populist promises and how much he could deliver as per his limited role in the president's capacity. I think one thing are the promises that obviously from this kind of a position cannot be kept. We also have to have in mind that he, whoever comes as president, steps into the shoes of whoever has been there before. And this is going to be the case also with the next government. So 
Uh, truth be told, I would not want to be in the shoes of either Yakov Milatovic or whoever uh, gets to form the next government of Montenegro. And thus, Andre, with all due respect, I would stay away from um, advising them. Uh, but when it comes to visits, and I think Joanna has given a very a uh, good second visit option. Uh, I think another possibility would be Kiev, uh, showing solidarity to the people of Ukraine, also giving a strong political message uh, as to where Montenegro stands in foreign policy, and possibly uh, Sarajevo uh, in terms of uh, doing some damage control as regards Berta's question vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ministers who had attended the uh the 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 celebration uh the the contested celebration in uh in in Banja Luka so i think that uh whichever symbolic visit takes place it is a sort of a message from uh Montenegro a message from Podgorica on the kind of a political course so uh let's see uh what uh what materializes there i also uh agree with Jovana uh, in the context of uh, whether the new government of Montenegro will be stable. I think that uh, there indeed will be way too many interests that uh, might be in conflict with one another. So, uh, and way too many pivotal players for the new government. So I, I think that the new government can be anything, but I would not characterize it as stable. Uh, but let's uh, let's see, and I hope to be proven uh, wrong on on this one. And one last thing, and I'll finish because I know we're reaching towards the uh, end of uh, of this webinar. Um, I think that Bertha was right when she mentioned that uh, this uh, shift of policy from Brussels has not been felt that much in uh, in the Western Balkans region. It probably has been felt far. Uh, to a far greater extent uh, in the uh, Eastern Partnership countries that have moved formally towards membership, uh, but in a way for the Western Balkans, something uh, a bit more concrete uh, would have needed to happen for these countries and uh, their people and their leadership to feel this shift. And we can talk about this in uh, in perhaps the next webinar or, uh, or a next event. Uh, but this year, I think, uh, is something, Corina, that you're right in saying that needs to be celebrated. It is the 20th anniversary of the Thessalonica summit, but not only. It is also a 30th anniversary of the Copenhagen criteria and the 10th anniversary of Croatia's accession. And that was the last country uh, to join the European Union. So I think that uh, we would, in a way, uh, it, it's the time that calls for reflection of uh, what uh, what the future of enlargement is uh, and how to move forward to make this process credible and successful for all countries that are seeking EU membership. And I'll leave it at this. Thank you. Absolutely, Elena. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. Uh, it's been a, an excellent conversation, a conversation that certainly has to continue, both with regards to uh, developments in Montenegro, and I mean, we're going to have to probably take stock again uh, after the parliamentary elections of, uh, of the situation and the dynamics in the country, and certainly we're going to have to discuss these big anniversaries and milestones and see where we go from here on this dossier. Many, many thanks uh, to all of you and to our very active participants and we we'll, I look forward I very much look forward to continuing this discussion uh, with you at a later point have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again bye bye thank you very much bye bye